Okay, so welcome to today's uh, segment of uh, the Third Testament Foundation live stream program. Um, today we're going to talk a little about the G word. Like it's almost as sensitive word as the F word, right? The G word. What's the G word, man? Can't say God anymore because that's not scientific, is it? So we're talking a little bit about God. What is God according to Martinus? Spiritual science and um, what is it not? I mean, for starters, God is not an old man with white beard sitting on a cloud somewhere, okay? Calling all the shots. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about this G word, what is it, and why are we so scared of using the G word, and when will it, be, when will it become popular again to use God in your day-to-day -day conversation with other people. So, um, and Martinez has a very clear and concise explanation to this. So, if we look at this symbol, it's called the Eternal Cosmic Organic Connection between God and Son of God. So, who is the Son of God? That's all living beings. And that's minerals, plants, animals, human beings, spiritual beings, all living beings everywhere is Son of God. And what is God? Well, to Martinus, God is this white dot right there. That's God. He also calls it X1 because it's nameless and it's unmanifest. It doesn't have a beginning. It never began. It will never end. It's eternal. So, you basically cannot say anything about what God is. I mean, if you say that X1 is God, then it's already wrong, right? So, because it's nameless in its nature. So, just for lack of a better word, we'll use God because we've been using God for eons in this world, right? So, if there was a time when God wasn't there, then there'll be a time where God is going to stop being. So, and that is not the case, because God is eternal, right? So, um, let's look a bit about this. Uh, I'm not going to go into more details about this, how God becomes the, the Son of God, or how the unmanifest becomes the manifest, other than we have this purple star around X1, or the unmanifest, and the purple star symbolizes the creative power of the living being and then these six colors symbolize the six basic uh, energy bodies of the living being, of all living beings. They look like this symbolically according to Martinus uh, spiritual sign. So we have to still uh, Remember that this is not anatomically correct, but it's symbolically correct, according to Martinez. Okay, so we have the six energy bodies. Again, the memory body, instinct body, gravity body, feeling body, intelligence body, and intuition body. Which are manifest bodies. So these manifest bodies we call X3. 
and they have a beginning and they have an end. Okay? And that's what makes evolution go forward because we keep having a, a satiation for something and then we keep satisfying that satiation or hunger and then when we are satisfied when we have satisfied satisfied the hunger <laughs> we are, are, are repelled by it right and then we go are hungry for something else and that is in the world of form or x3 in the temporal world not the eternal world because the eternal will is forever right no beginning and no end hunger and satiation has a beginning and an end so uh, enough said about that we can see also that the uh, you see the white ring it is also x1 of the unmanifest aka God of uh, so that's uh, symbolizing the ring is symbolizing all other living beings in the universe if you are at the center or I am in the center all the other living beings around me are uh, also ha also have God at their core okay so that's the white ring again x1 x2 and x3 same triune principle applies here so what we're going to talk about today is because we at all times in the evolutionary spiral cycle are at one with God at the core of our being is our I is our God I we're all at one with God it's the same I we all share and that is this eternal unmanifest something that is it's a nameless something Martinez calls it X1 okay and that's the white because we cannot exist without being or having X1 at our core eternally there, there will never be a time where we're not at one with God at our core. But according to where we are in evolution, at different uh, stages in evolution, we perceive or experience this at one with God differently. We don't, we're not conscious that we're uh, at one with God at all times. So that depends where we are in evolution. For example, if we look at these four um, <clears throat> uh, huh. excuse me, we have these four on the left here. Uh, these are the quality of the connection uh, between the God, the Son of God, and God. Okay, this is the quality. That's how we experience uh, this um, connection between ourselves and our eternal I, aka God. So we see here at this evolutionary level, the being, uh, the triangle symbolizes a living being, and there is a uh, uh, an 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 over a weight of the uh, or uh, of the yellow which is uh, feeling energy so, so it's predominantly uh, this being is predominantly uh, guided by its feelings and only a little bit of intelligence and this is representative of all the the nature uh, Aboriginal religions and Native Americans and, and uh, nature uh, believes that uh, there there's spirit in everything so this is the Christian mark that's how they connect to God the next um, of course this is a continuum so we're, we're just taking four snapshots of this continuum of evolution of uh, being day conscious aware of our uh, at one minute with God 
So in the next one here, number two, we see there's still question mark. We don't really know what God is, but we know that there is some kind of being there that is God. Could be a old man with white hair and beard sitting on a cloud or on a throne somewhere. But we don't know what God is. We have a little more intelligence, but still uh, predominantly feeling is guiding this these individuals. So these are mostly the people that were it's enough for them just to uh, have faith and and believe in what the authorities are telling them and what the priests are telling them and what politicians and teachers and parents are telling them and that's okay they're okay with that they don't question authority they don't investigate the truth or the deeper truth of the what authorities are telling them so these this that's for them it's enough to believe and at a certain time we evolve out of that we get fed up or satiated with it we're no longer hungry for just believing we want to know what's uh, going on what is the unhidden truth or the cause and effect behind these authorities and their statements and so forth right so we uh, evolve uh, out of uh, the religious uh, context which means that we do not use the G word anymore we become atheists and scientists and everything has to be based on uh, evidence and research and so forth right so we have our materialistic era that we we know so well today and this era has given us a lot of of good things right natural sciences so we, but we see the being here is guided by uh, predominantly intelligence energy green and not so much feeling energy so there's still an unbalance now over uh, yeah so this head and skull just means that the beings here believe only in the one life that when we die that's it there's no more eternity does not exist there's only this one life and then when you die you're gone so they believe in death they believe atheists believe in the uh, non-existence of God. There are actually there are actually uh, atheist uh, churches in America that celebrate the uh, on Sunday they have social events and they they celebrate the non-existence of God. But now there are diff these different branches of the atheist churches. They're just starting to tell each other, well, the way you're worshiping the non-existence of God is not the right way to worship the non-existence of God. You know, you should do it this way. So there's still an element of belief and religion in this um, uh, this evolutionary stage. Yeah. And um, why is that? Well, that is because when you have, for example, a hypothesis or a, a theory and so forth, it's only probable, right? It's probabilities. You don't know f for a fact. It's just a theory. So it's still basically a belief. You have to believe in something, but it's you back it up with science and it's more or less probable. But then 10 years later, they find out, oh, well, you know, we find out something new and actually it wasn't like that now it's like this so it keeps changing right so it's still kind of science is still kinda of have these religious child diseases so we don't know the, the truth hundred percent we're not hundred percent certain of what the truth is and that means we're not day conscious aware that we are at one with God in fact we reject God and the existence of God. We deny the existence of God here in this materialistic stage. And that's okay. Okay? It's just an evolutionary stage. It's a phase everybody has to go through. So, in this 
last evolutionary stage where we actually are um, day conscious aware that we and God or our eternal identity is uh, the same. Our eye and the eye of God is the same. God's source and me are the same. My eye and your eye, your eternal eye and my eternal eye, are sourced in the same something that is, right? Nameless, unmanifest, eternal life force. And that, again, is at the core here, the white circle, okay? But now we actually experience it on a, a consistent day-to-day -day basis that we are, in fact, that eternal being. And when we are here, we can do things and see th things in a totally different perspective that the beings in the other three uh, stages cannot because we can see the real cause and effect of things and why things happen and what we should do to make uh, th to certain things that are not so good disappear and so forth. So what would imagine what would happen if we had these beings here and these are rare beings, right? Because they're very highly evolved. What would happen? What would happen if we had these beings at the at the at least some beings, at least one in each government of all the nations in the world? If we had one being like that, that could see the real connection of things, and could advise the government of the world, where do you think we would be? You know. That would be interesting, I would say. So, um, uh, let's just read about these beings here in this stage. Because uh, Martinez writes about it in um, uh, the Third Testament, the, the Eternal World Picture, Volume 2. Uh, and uh, before that, I found something about praying to God and how Martinez defines this. And he says, praying to God, there is thus an organ in the being that begins working automatically when his life is in danger. It is this organ or ability that gradually evolves to become what we call the ability of the human being to pray to God. Prayer or praying to God is thus not rooted in any human invention but in an innate cosmic organic ability through which the being is eternally and organically connected to the Godhead. Whether or not the being is conscious or unconscious of this unshakable cosmic connection with the Godhead does not alter the principle at all. Uh, the animal that utters its cry of terror or cry of death is not conscious of any Godhead, it does not know to whom it cries, but nonetheless it cries out automatically about its distressed situation to an unknown object. So this is uh, Martinez talking about what prayer is. It's actually like I was when I read this, I thought about you know when you see these these movies where oh the plane is gonna uh, start to crash and you're sitting in the plane and all the people <laughs> start to pray. Even the ones that don't really believe in God, right? Really all the atheists and the materialists in the third phase, they're still okay. And Martina says, well, it doesn't matter if you believe in God or not. Prayer works. So, and it's this uh, triggered by this situation. Oh, I'm going to die, right? So you, this is like the, he calls it the cry uh, what is it he calls it? The cry of death, or cry of, cry of death, yeah? The cry of terror. When you're terrified, you're like, ah, oh, that cry in the animal, they go like, ah, oh, automatically. This is automatic organ that we have. That once we like threaten with, like faced with death, automatically we'll begin to do something 
and that is prayer. Okay. So uh, let's go back to uh, that was just a little uh, parenthesis here. These beings here, phase four, right here, uh, that are day conscious, aware of their at one with God. So they experience that they're one with God every day. That must be nice. Imagine that. That you are like... You can just feel that you're this eternal being. That must be nice, yeah. You never began, you'll never end. You're just forever. So... The fourth figure above the living being symbolizes the finished human being in God's image after his likeness. We see in the symbol that the being's intelligence and feeling here are in balance. That's the green and the yellow, right? In equal proportion to each other. They are equal and penetrate one another. So that's the, the green and the yellow in the actual cone there, which symbolizes the connection, the, the, the conscious or the experience of the connection. So, feeling has thus become intellectualized. And when intellectualized, Machinos means it's a combination of intelligence and intuition energy. So, feeling has thus become intellectualized and intelligence has become humanized. This in turn means that both faculties are now totally in the service of neighborly love in this being. So this is compassion, yeah? It now fulfills the law of life. It loves God above all things and its neighbor as itself. That's the law of life. Like do unto others uh, like you want others do to you. It has become a cosmically conscious human being, a Christ, <coughs> a, a Christ being, a being that is one with God. I mean, we're always one with God, but now at this phase in evolution, we're consciously aware of it. We're day consciously aware that we are, in fact, one with God or our, this eternal I that we are. It is now the ultimate fulfillment of God's creation of the human being. It has become a human being in God's image after his likeness. That just means that it's also eternal. No beginning, no end. It experiences God, X1, as a day conscious fact. More alive and conscious the connection with the Godhead cannot be. The being's day conscious experience of God is symbolized by the white triangle at the top. After this, the being is finished with having to incarnate in physical matter. It does not need to experience more physical terrestrial lives. It is through the beings in the primary consciousness of God that he reveals his infinite wisdom, his universal love, and his omnipotence. So it's through these beings that are now day conscious aware uh, that there are eternal beings that God, God's source, reveals its infinite wisdom. Okay? It is the primary consciousness of this Godhead or God source that constitutes the absolutely true reality behind the physical plane. That means God or the eternal, your, your eternal I, who you are experiencing in this phase of evolution that you are one with, is creating what, what we see in the physical plane. It is through this reality that the entire universe is governed and led. So this Godhead or God source, this uh, God source, first eternal, unutterable one, or unmanifest eternal I of the entire universe governs and leads all of creation in X3. Yeah? It is also by virtue of this primary consciousness of 
the Godhead, consisting of the highest and most perfect beings that the keynote of the universe is love. So that means this primary consciousness of God, that's all the beings that, that are at this evolutionary stage where they are day conscious aware that they are actually at one with their eternal eye. They um, uh -huh. Yeah, they are the perfect beings that constitute the primary consciousness of the Godhead, okay? So the ones that are not yet awake to that, that means the other three uh, that are not day conscious aware that they are one with God, that's the secondary consciousness of God, okay? So um, let's just... Uh, look a little, before we read on here. Uh, look at this symbol here, because um, if we look at uh, this thought climate here, you see this long one with this lens in the middle. Okay, so. That actually uh, um, symbolize the uh, psychic thought climate. And that is actually the thought climate we use to uh, pray with. It's actually starting with uh, black magic and voodoo and stuff on the lower evolutionary levels and then it develops as we grow in evolution and go forward in the evolutionary spiral cycle to become white magic and white magic is psychic power and it's also uh, prayer so if we uh, read about this thought climate Martinus uh, says that this figure symbolizes all high psychic forces and culminates in the period of evolution number 30. So that's just, here's 30, right? So this one here is the 30. So it culminates, that's where the lens is, right? That's the culmination. You see how it's beginning here? down here and there's all kind of red, orange and kind of brownish colors and that's like you have voodoo, black magic, all kind of stuff here. And then it culminates here with the lenses and then it tapers off and dies out and ends here. So we're in X3, right? We're in the temporal world, not the eternal because the eternal does not have a beginning and an end. So this thought climate is something that we have created as an eternal being. So um, we see how it becomes more and more light blue, uh, a, a balance between like the yellow and the, and the green here, yeah? More like loving and stuff, intuition, things like that. So we see how they like, got six sack things, that's like communication, prayer, white magic, and what does Martinez say about it? Um, he says, uh, <laughs> While the reddish orange colors at the bottom of the figure signify the killing principle, which in this case means black magic, the light yellow and green colors above signif signify the principle of universal love in the service of which the psychic force becomes white magic. So this is the psychic thought climate, right? Psychic force becomes white magic. So what is psychic force? Psychic is your thoughts. What do you do when you pray? You concentrate your thoughts, right? So that's a psychic force of concentrated thoughts. Prayer. So here yeah, the psychic force becomes white magic. Through this spiritual or psychic force, prayer, 
the wonderful manifestations that we call miraculous healing, materialization, and dematerialization, telepathy, organic clairvoyance, and organic clairaudience, and so on occur. These abilities enable the finished human being in God's image to be organically connected with high cosmic beings on the spiritual plane who together constitute God's instrument for guiding and leading mankind towards becoming his image after his likeness. This wonderful manifestation instrument of the Godhead for mankind is what we call providence. So providence is all these beings that are actually day conscious aware that they are at one with God. So because they are day consciously aware that they are one with God, they are always they always agree with the other beings that are at one with God, or consciously aware that they are one with God. Yeah, there are no uh, there are no uh, struggles with this. Is it this way or that way? Disputes and stuff. So these beings thus constitute the Godhead's organ for interaction um, the Godhead's organ so these beings are the Godhead's organ for interaction with every single terrestrial human being through these elevated cosmic beings the Godhead hears the beings prayers and comes to a decision about them this providence is also the world redemption itself. As previously mentioned, it is through this providence that the Godhead controls and guides the evolution of the whole of mankind, its entire transformation from animal into human being. The cosmic or spiritual co-workers of these beings are called angels. By virtue of their great psychic gifts, they can hear the prayers of physical human beings. They cannot free people from their karma, but they can, to a great extent, help those who pray earnestly in their hour of need and give them courage, energy, and encouragement to get through their sufferings. They are invisibly present everywhere. No human beings are ever outside their reach. They follow us all on our way ready to protect us in those situations where we can be protected and to help us in those situations where we must of necessity go through our dark karma. It would therefore be very advantageous and wise to express our situation in a prayer. It should be addressed not to these beings, but on the contrary exclusively and directly to God within the concept of Father who art in heaven. One can also in the same way express one's gratitude and joy in living, if that is the way one feels. Even though one is unable to believe in prayer, one ought to pray all the same. God is not so small-minded that he does not listen unconditionally to the prayer of an unhappy being. <laughs> okay, so just to wrap this up, uh, Imagine now if these beings um, uh, these day, these beings that are day conscious aware of that they're one with God. Imagine if they would be in government like I talked about before. So like here we have the unfinished human kingdom. This is planet Earth. Right now we see all the arrows representing the different nations. They're, and they're all selfishly going in different kind of directions, right? There's no coherency or unselfish or community feeling here. It's just like every man for himself, every nation for himself, dog eat dog, nation eat nation, war, strife, and whatever. How can I get the most out of this situation, like financially, monetarily, right? Money being the the right here and the guiding principle of all nations more or less but imagine if we had these high evolved beings within government so we see this uh, 12 pointed star in the next picture um, here 
we see how this 12-point star has gone to the core of the planet. So that means now that this is a planet that is governed by intuition. And that means uh, that there are, being, there are beings in government that know how to make peace on the planet. So because there are these beings in government, all the countries are working together in community with a common goal that are uh, sourced in unselfishness. Okay, So the governments are ruled by unselfishness, which is compassion and neighborly love, right? So, and, and that is, uh, I, I believe that the beings, we need beings that are at this high evolutionary stage where they're actually conscious that they're at one with God. So they know what's the truth and what course to take for each country in order to, uh, all countries to, to coexist in harmony with each other, okay? So, this Machinus calls the perfect human kingdom of the future. And eventually, this will happen. Maybe not tomorrow, maybe not next year, maybe not in a hundred years, but it'll happen. Maybe 500, 500 years. Already, I, I, I think he says in a hundred years, when he was alive, hundred years, the countries will start to uh, have uh, Christic policies in their governments. So we can see that some countries are more more um, taking care of their citizens than others. So we are seeing this principle of unselfishness in the whole governmental structure, societal structure gradually grow in, in uh, all the countries at different uh, at different rates of course. So um, Heaven on Earth. This is a symbolic expression of heaven on Earth. And what does Martinus actually say about uh, this? <clears throat> so this is from the Third Testament, Volume One, where he talks about the right and the might of the governments and the states. So the present collective experience of the whole of terrestrial mankind will thus gradually bring all its concentration to bear on this factor the unification of might with right so might is power right and right is the truth i mean that these high evolved beings that know that uh, they consciously aware with god can see what is right we, we cannot always, uh, if, if you're not day consciously aware that you are at one with God, uh, you cannot uh, see. There's no guarantee that you can see what is right. Okay? So that's why we need these beings within government as advisors or some, some kind of thing. And it's not like they want to have power or anything. Actually, they don't. that's the least thing they want. But they know what's right. And we need to combine that right, righteousness, justice, with the might, with the, the, where the money goes, okay? The money needs to go to the right places, where it's righteous that they go. So, okay. Uh, the present collective experience of the whole of terrestrial mankind will thus gradually bring all its concentration to bear in this factor, unification of might with right. So this is where we're going gradually. It's inevitable. But as right within terrestrial mankind's community is the same as state power, and this is the uncorrupted state power, okay? And might within that community is the same as money power, the unification of right with might means that state power must have possession of the money power. 
Okay, so this is where the whole thing with sovereign money comes in, and uh, the central banks should not make the money because they're private elite uh, uh, held banks, but we need the states to make the money. Okay? State power must have possession of the money power. Okay, so and this is the uncorrupted state. This is not the state that has been lobbied by multinationals and, and controlled by money. Okay, this is the uncorrupted state power. So the state power that knows what is right. Okay, only right alone can possess the valuable goods because beings that knows what is right, the beings that know what is right, they can appropriate the goods righteously instead of uh, totally out of proportion with a few percent of the people on the planet owns like 80 percent of the might, okay, the money. So, as right is represented by state power, uncorrupted state power, and this again stands for common interest or unselfishness, while money power is the expression for private interest or selfishness. So that's easy, yeah? State power, unselfishness, money power, selfishness. Then the consequence will be that unselfishness appropriates might or the valuable goods. When the spirit of unselfishness controls the valuable goods and thereby has the power, only then can peace reign. Selfishness controlling might, as is still the case in the terrestrial community, right? today, that's what we see in the world, can create only that spirit which makes one strife into actualities. The spirit of right must therefore be made the ruler of the world. Right, which has now reached its highest manifestation in the form of state power, uncorrupted state power, constitutes nothing more than a reality which is ruled by might. Okay, that, and let me do that again because he talks about how st the state power is not uncorrupt. So, right, which has now reached its highest manifestation in the form of state power, constitutes nothing more than a reality which is ruled by might. Okay, so this is what we have today. We have governments that with a whole slew of lobbyists, multinationals that are represent that represent the might, the money power, right? It must become a reality which rules might. So the state power must become a reality which rules might. That is state power, uncorrupt state power must become a reality that has the money and controls the money. So then will look like this, and then there will be peace and harmony, and this is the peace, the new world, where peace and harmony prosper, okay? And we're going there, it's inevitable that we'll be there, it's just a matter of when. So on that note, I say thank you for today, and uh, hope to see you next time. Uh, in a week and uh, see you soon